Hello. Hi. 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 Hello. I'm curious about. I'm curious about. I'm curious I'm about. Curious about. I'm curious about building open, authentic, loving relationship. I'm curious about jealousy. I'm curious about polyamory. Does it just mean that you're fucking all the time? How can I tell my parents that my partner is already married? I'm curious about... How do you know when you're too busy to have another relationship? I'm curious about dominant and subordinate relationship. I'm curious about sexual health. How can relationships, How can relationships evolve, evolve with people evolve as they grow and change? Grow and change? Hi, welcome to the Curious Fox podcast for those challenging the status quo in love, sex and relationships. My name is Effie Blue. And I'm Jacqueline Misla. And today, Effie and I are revisiting one of our most popular podcast episodes of all time. Drum roll. Relationship Anarchy. Relationship Anarchy, or RA, has probably been the most elusive topic we tackled at Curious Fox. The first time that I actually heard the phrase relationship anarchy was at a Curious Fox event. So it was not this panel discussion. This was right after my wife and I started to go to Curious Fox events. If you've been listening to the Infidelity Trilogy, you know that after after that experience, we started to go to Curious Fox events and started doing a lot of research and being a part of community. And we went to one on age and polyamory. And in my mind, I was like, this is going to be great. This is a bonding experience for my wife and I. We're going to go to these events together. And I remember that actually it was Conchetta who was in the audience of that event, but is on the panel of this discussion, Mm -hmm. referenced relationship anarchy and non-hierarchical relationships. And I remember at the time hearing her say that and thinking, that's crazy. Like, who wants to do that? That sounds wild. <laughs> and I remember we like listened to the panel discussion and everything. And then, you know, on the way home, we we're talking about it. And again, in my mind, this is about us figuring out how we're going to do this together and how we're going to like create this amazing relationship that can encompass other connection. And my wife turns to me and said, you know, that relationship anarchy, like that sounds right. <laughs> That, Uh you know, that really, that and and non-hierarchical relationships, that really resonates with me. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? (laughs) Curse you, curious. Exactly. (laughs) Damn you, curious fox. (laughs) Introducing such blasphemous ideas into my wife's head. I was like, we will never go to a curious fox event again. Um, <laughs> That's funny. That's so and so funny. of course we continued to do it but at the time I thought that that was crazy and horrible and I was not into it at all and now actually our structure I wouldn't say it's relationship anarchy but it is certainly not hierarchical I'm not surprised by your uh, reaction to be honest because relationship anarchy has underpinnings and political ideo- ideology of anarchy and one thing we can definitely say about this ideology that it is misunderstood Most of us conjure images of violence, chaos, and apocalyptic disarray when we hear the word. (laughs) And when we hear it next to a word like relationship, so close to home, most of us clutch our hearts in anticipation of break and ache and shake our heads in confusion and dismay. (laughs) It's true. Well, that, so that, that is what's interesting to me is because while that term relationship anarchy sent me into cold sweats, it clearly resonated with a lot of people because it is by far our most popular episode. So why, (laughs) why do you think that is? I know, right? It's hard to imagine that that relationship anarchy can really be a model for a healthy relationship. I think this conception really dismisses the lessons that relationship anarchy can actually teach us. Mm. I think as its core, anarchy is about autonomy and absence of hierarchy, right? Uh, It advocates for self-governance over authority. It denounces concepts like capitalism, the state and the democracy through elected officials, It's definitely being described as radical. However, when we looked closer at the belief systems of anarchy, we may be surprised to find how closely it aligns with nonviolent ideologies such as Buddhism. So when you start to research relationship anarchy, the first name you come across is Andy Nordgren, who coined the term relationship anarchy and penned the short instructional manifesto for relationship anarchy. You can find it all over the internet. I encourage you to read it. 
Uh, it's a great read. She talks about abundant love, respect, and uniqueness of relationships, operating from a core set of values, rejecting the burden of normativity and shoulds, as well as coming from a place of trust and assuming the best of intentions, handling change through communication, and being intentional about your commitments. When you look at it like that, there really is anything bad about this. Mm-hmm. And as one of the panelists in this episode puts it, Relationship anarchy is an expression of radical love, which I love to hear. So does radical love resonate with you? Are you curious about relationship anarchy? Listen in and indulge your curiosity. Enjoy the episode. So today we're going to discuss relationship anarchy. The way the flow of this is going to go, uh, I'm going to pass it on to my panelists who are individually going to introduce themselves I'm going to start with Amir and the further end, and we're going to come in. In some ways, I guess I was sort of a relationship anarchist as soon as I started dating, although I had no idea that there was a name for it. Uh, I had no access to any information about non-monogamy as a philosophy, a relationship orientation, anything like that. I uh, grew up in a very heteronormative, militaristic, somewhat machoist society, a lot of pressure to kind of conform. And I remember sort of really challenging a lot of the ideas about why people kind of form these couple units and, you know, form marriages and all these rules and ideologies around that uh, and wanting to challenge it and, and basically trying to actually relate to, you know, form intimate relationships around me in different ways and eventually kind of succumbing to the the pressure. So after several years of trying to do that, I ended up in a very monogamous marriage. Uh, This was after I came to New York already and then rolled the clock forward about 15 or more years, opened up that marriage and went through the whole sort of journey that most people tend to go through that come to non-monogamy from the more traditional sort of marriage kind of framework and then trying to deconstruct that and and find other ways of of forming relationships which we'll we'll get to i guess uh in in this discussion and then it was a long journey to eventually find myself back where i was when i was 15 i think in terms of really trying to challenge all of those social constructs about how relationships should form, what makes for an intimate relationship, how one defines them, how one sort of uh, works with them. And that's sort of been, I think, my last sort of three years or so, just trying to kind of live in that mindset and that framework. What are we doing? Name, name pronouns. Are we doing sure, pronouns? Yeah. Name, uh, Wendy, she, they. Um, I really loosely identify as a relationship anarchist, hybrid relationship anist, an- anarchist and Buddhist practitioner because that has highly informed the way that I do relationship. I loosely identify because I don't really uh, adhere to labels. I don't internalize labels either. I think they're really excellent pointers, but really uh, awful identities. For me, I experience them as being fairly limited. So um, I think really from the onset, I was uh, really put off with the idea of hierarchical relationships and monogamy. I never married. I did want children and I chose to have children and raise them on my own. My children have been fundamental teachers in doing relationship. I've experienced the most intimacy with them. I've experienced the most letting go with them. They really, really were uh, phenomenal teachers in so far as learning a lot about autonomy and letting them have autonomy, uh, allowing myself to have it, learning that relationships transition and they do so organically. And so I really think that my, my approach was highly informed by having kids and being a parent. I did uh, effort to do monogamy a few times in my life and they were always short lived and felt pretty unnatural to me. So I think I sort of loosely practiced RA for a long time. 
before I really knew what it was. And I'd say in the last five years, I probably more concretely and with greater awareness uh, do RA. And again, like I said, uh, my Buddhist practice and mindfulness practices have been really instrumental in being able to do that skillfully. Hey, I'm Conchetta. She, they, her, doesn't really matter to me. Yeah, I relate. The labels are kind of strange because that's the point of anarchy is that you don't group. And here we are talking about our group. Yeah. Um, it's a little confusing in that sense, but all I can speak from is from what comes naturally to me as opposed to um, anarchy as a philosophy, you know, as a, as a theory. I'm, I'm really going to come at it just from what, how I relate. It wouldn't be possible to talk about this without going into childhood. Um, I grew up in a family of nine children in Asia, a very atypical childhood. I was always in the spotlight, always on stage for better and for worse. And my mother was extremely hierarchical when it came to love and attention and affection. Boys were first, women were second. And then we all had our roles. Like we had to prove ourselves for being good at something. So from very young age, I learned that love came in hierarchy and I had to earn attention. And then when I was 13, I was kicked out of my home and I went into the foster care system in Asia, which was a long journey of trying to find security. And this is the part that I, I wasn't gonna talk about, <laughs> but this is literally why I find myself seated here today. What I noticed, the, the most hurtful parts of being in the foster system were actually the good memories because I always knew they weren't gonna last. When I found a family that was wonderful, that actually had the non-abusive, kind, loving, everything I always wanted as a child, just unconditional love, I knew there was a clock ticking. Why? Because I was not their actual child. So at some point it was going to end. And that is what cemented for me this sense that when I'm looking for love, I don't want conditions on it. I don't want any classifications for this. And I didn't understand it at the time that that's what I was looking for. Fast forward, I grew up Christian, extremely conservative. I met someone, fell in love when I was 19, stayed with this person, ended up getting married at 24 abstinence. Oh. Yeah. All of that sexual morality, everything like many people in this non-monogamous journey started out monogamous with traditional values, not really chosen, but chosen for us. Right. Culturally by year eight, I booked a national tour and the first I was married at this point. And the first question people asked me after congratulations was, but what will your partner say? And I didn't like it really didn't even occur to me that this was a form of sexism or patriarchal hierarchical relationship constructs. Like I didn't I was just confused. It's like, what do you mean? What, what, he, what he say? And this just continued. But what will he do? Is he OK with it? And when I talked to him about it, he didn't understand that either. So both of us were kind of perplexed. Like, what do you mean? Love me? Support me? be happy for me, all of those things. Um, that continued. We opened up our relationship. I've been open for three years, polyamorous for two. And I discovered this like anarchy word because when I started dating, like this was like really scandalous. I was dating other people who were like married or, you know, like just figuring out where you fit on OkCupid, you know, I would meet these guys who had facial hair. So they looked like my partner. So it was like, okay. And, and we'd be sitting there and talking and like some of the first conversation starters were like, let me tell you about my construct. You know, <laughs> we date on Thursdays, you know, my partner and I split all of our bills when we date, you know, like they had like all these rules. And like, again, I didn't understand anarchy. I didn't even understand polyamory, but I was like, what is that? The whole point of opening this up was to be open. Like, this is so structured. And it, like, again, I didn't have the words for it, but it's it just to me, there's nothing wrong with hierarchy. But for me, it felt wrong. There were just so many rules. The more into polyamory I got, the worse off I felt. And I was like, what is this? I don't understand because I love the idea of open sex, love, communication, freedom to explore whatever I want. And yet everybody I'm dating who says those things on their profile have more rules than monogamous men do mm -hmm. and women. And I couldn't understand that. And it was through these like constant relationships that someone called me an anarchist. And I was like, like Bernie Sanders? I was like, <laughs> like, is that what that is? 
And, and that was the journey. You kind of start to discover it, you know? And then I realized on these dates, it was kind of like these partners were showing their pool hours. Like here's our pool hours, bathing suits only on weekends, potential nudity allowed. You may have a child, but escort over the age of 18. Mm -hmm. That's what it felt like dating them. But on my end, I was like, I mean, I have a pool and like, if you want to be nude, you can go over there and the prude people can be there. And there's like the shallow side. And if you want to like do synchronized swimming, like the middle is really great for that, you know? And that's like how I feel about relationships is like, and I think this is like, if you Google anarchy and relationship hierarchy, the things that'll show up are autonomy, which is really big. And for me, that means I'm not going to ask you for permission, but that doesn't mean I don't give a shit. And that's the misconception that I find a lot of people have about anarchy and um, non-hierarchical relationships is that we just do whatever the fuck we want. And that's just, I think that's just up to the in individual. So there's a lot of communication. I want to know if my actions are impacting you and how to make you more comfortable, but I don't always want to tell you where I am. And you kind of have to be okay with that. And we can talk about that and create agreements, but I'm not going to ask you if I can be a performer. I'm not going to ask you in the same way if I can have a mom. I'm not going to ask you if if I can have children, I'm not going to ask you if I can go fuck someone tonight. And I'm not going to expect you to come to me. It works both ways. For me, that's the number one of relationship anarchy. And a lot of people disagree with this and that's okay. But for me, that's number one. That's, that's why I really relate to this. That's exactly the discussions that we, we want to have tonight. Conchetta um, shared briefly like the background um how she got to this philosophy today i would love to hear that if you're comfortable i would love to hear that from you a, a little bit like what what was your journey like what led you here what were the markers along the way that led you to to, to practice something like relationship anarchy and and also anarchy is a political brief and a belief so it's it's not just something that you practice in your relationships but it's a way of life well it is now <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think I know what you're saying. What are the underpinnings? Um, well, I grew up in the punk rock scene. Um, I grew up a squatter, in fact. And and so I really lived anarchy as, as a kid. And I also found a lot of the things that happen in the punk rock scene are not anarchy. So I grew up in the punk rock scene. I was really I was exposed to Buddhist practice and uh, Eastern thought really early on. And it's very fascinating to me how the two actually can and, and do coexist and they support each other. And I feel like, you know, they balance each other out for me and they it's I've not once come into conflict mm -hmm. with it. You know, I, I obviously gravitated to that scene because of some innate qualities in me that really craved autonomy. But also, I mean, in, in, in the in the within the light of uh, RA, like I, I understood and valued a collective approach too. I think I really have a sort of sense of collective individualism, you know, where I both respect other people's choice to be autonomous and to be an individual and to respect their own process and to respect their yeah. growth. That is 100%. Like all my relationships have to be growth based. Like it doesn't even matter if you're doing my taxes. Like <laughs> I really will gravitate to people who are mostly just really, really interested in growing. So for me, it's a huge anchor because it's like, I need things to be growth based. And if doing you means not doing that thing, I would prefer you to do, then that's okay. Actually, as long as, as, as you're going where you grow and as long as you're letting me do that also, it's super important. Um, and I think I've always valued that and it's been fundamental and it's, it's been with me since my like early punk rock days. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up the issue of control, right? And to relate it to the question about political underpinnings and um, the philosophy aspect of RA, if you think about monogamy and what it, what it means, it's interesting because we don't tend to think about it unt until we go outside of it and then we start to look at it and try to deconstruct it. But it really is in many ways built on the notion of control and ownership. And one could basically see the beginning of it in the uh, agricultural revolution with a notion of ownership of land and then ownership of the people who work the land and then ownership of the people who raise the people who work the land, right? So it really, in many ways, in my mind, uh, as a philosophy and a social sort of construct, monogamy is all about owning people and controlling them. And so non-monogamy 
as a philosophy in my mind is all about deconstructing that. Asking about how I came to all of those ideas, I think a lot of them were very sort of unformed at an earlier age. But as I started to practice non-monogamy, you know, first coming across words like polyamory much earlier and, and having similar experience to what you're describing, Conchetta, realizing that a lot of the worlds of polyamory and, and non-monogamy are, are really just repeating the same ideas. Like adaptations. Just adaptations, right. So you kind of take away the sexual exclusivity aspect, right? So when I said that it's a big construct, right, it's three different things when people say monogamy. One is sexual exclusivity as a practice. And that's the first thing people usually start to take away when they want to practice other things. Then there's the notion of the sort of relationship orientation, right? Which I think a lot of us have this sort of non-monogamous orientation that does have the need and want to, to have more intimate relationships in many more ways. And then there's the philosophy and the sort of social kind of implication of what it means to control others and be in an intimate relationship with another, what it means about their uh, responsibility for your emotions, for instance, right? Uh, a lot of the, the philosophical underpinnings. And in my mind, it's relationship anarchy is the first sort of time that we're trying to formulate a lot of those ideas mm -hmm. around a more cohesive sort of philosophical framework that really goes back, way back to anarcho-feminism of like Emma Goldman and, and even further back to individual anarchism. So, yeah, it is sort of like you were saying, we're still forming that, but it's... it's I, yeah, it, it's very much it, in its infancy. Yeah. Also, I think by nature, it's going to evolve, right? The, the, if you think about the way it's, it's about non-governance, about autonomy, it's about flow, it's about moving with the needs of, 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 of the group as it changes. In, in the present moment. In the yeah. present moment. So by nature, I think it's going to keep evolving, keep changing, keep shifting, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, but isn't that like the nature of relationship already? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think one of the things we're taking away is like uh, all of this sort of concepts we have, all the ideas we have around it, mm -hmm. around relationship. And we're then just allowing it to to sort of happen organically mm -hmm. and, and pulling back some of the, the ways that we control mm -hmm. relationship. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I think that's ultimately what all three of us have in common is that we're saying what comes most naturally as opposed to what's been done. Yeah. And what I hear from you to you guys were kind of like, it was always there. I just didn't know it. I didn't know. I didn't have yeah, a language for absolutely. it. And I, I had it the, the, the inheritance of, you know, the punk rock scene and Buddhism. <laughs> you found it. You found it so young. Um, yeah. Yeah. I had a sweet yeah. inheritance there, but like yeah. it, it's what's really cool. And I've heard that before is yeah. that people say it was just kind of always there. Like mm -hmm. I had these yeah. ideas. I felt this way. Yeah. I just didn't know what that looked mm -hmm. like. And even when I did find RA, it was a relief. Like when I found mm -hmm. that this is a thing. Mm. And actually it's not just on my mind or mm. it's not just the way that I'm functioning. I felt included for sure. Included. I, yeah. That's, that's, that's like the best part of it. When you feel fully part of the party, you know, yeah. And you, you yeah. were saying that you, that you yeah. feel it's radical because we're on the fringes and we're usually the only person in the room and we're oh. even in a non-monogamous. Mm -hmm. You know how many group. times I have to, and it's, I enjoy talking about it. Like, I don't look miserable right now. I don't think <laughs> but like what's, what's not so enjoyable is all of the implications that come at you. Where's your partner? Mm -hmm. Oh, he's not here again, huh? Is or he real? <laughs> <laughs> Really, like you, you guys laugh, but and you all laugh, but like I, I get that all the time. I'm still with the partner that I was married There's to. There's a lot of explanation, and they don't understand yeah. why I do things separately, and I might not always know where he is because this person is an individual that I love and appreciate and want to let him free. Mm -hmm. For me, non-monogamy and polyamory and then monogamy, I agree. They're kind of similar because they're just different levels of control a lot of the times. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to control your dick, but I want to control your heart. Well, I, 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 you know what I mean? But like, ultimately, that's all fear based. I take a gentler approach. I think they're all different ways of organizing. And we're, but we're, we're, we're moving, we're moving from, you know, this really sort of intellectual mind which has value mm -hmm. intellectual mind space and from as a as a meditator i would see that um as as our people who are 
practicing RA, we're sort of moving from a different space. We're allowing more spaciousness. More That's how spacious, I feel. Spacious. Mind. And that was originally what we were talking about is that, and if you prefer, you know, no, no titles, if we just go names, there's Steven and Olivia. Olivia has been in my life. Steven, shorter amount of time. One of them I'm actually secretly still married to. <laughs> and we've talked about like divorcing and not telling anyone. And then when we die, everybody will find out. <laughs> But now this is on a podcast, so <laughs> not everybody knows. Whoops. But I don't think my mom's listening to this, so she won't know. But the fact that I love them both and I have space for both of them and they actually ask for a different space from me. So the classification only exists on the individual level. My space for you and my space for you is truly about what you and I need from each other and what you and I need from each other, not because, well, you and I met each other first. And so this is what we've decided. Is this okay? Okay, great. Okay. So what, what I'm okay with is this. And that's the difference. I really like to use my children in this. I'm like, mm. and, or children, if you're a child, I'll, we all are, or a parent, you know that you don't love one kid more than the other. Mm. That, that, it's I actually not time. possible. Yes. They're two totally different kids. They're two different people. You have a different bond. They have different needs. And so as someone who has to organize a small society called my family, um, <laughs> I know that there is structure. I know that there is, but I know that walls are moving all the mm-hmm. time. I love that. And I know that I am, um, efforting to be completely embodied to our experience Mm -hmm. for sure yeah yeah Mm -hmm. questions we can keep talking any questions we can keep talking Uh, (laughs) um... so i'm just curious like uh this is the first time i've heard coming to this event about relationship anarchy though i've been known about polyamory for many many years it seems that involves a lot of trust And I'm just curious, how do each of the panelists deal with the challenges around that? Because this seems to me takes an even deeper level of trust, because the less structure you have, the more trust there has to be. Yeah, I was saying it's similar to the notion of the assumption of positive intent. You know, so you come to a relationship from a place of assuming the other person is not there trying to hurt you or... And I think that does wonders to relationships to to sort of take that as the basis, even when you are challenged, even when you are hurt, even when you are in difficult sort of emotional situations, to always sort of come back to that as the the kind of fundamental basis. At least in in my world, that that seemed to make a, a very big difference in the kind of dynamics that that are are formed. That makes trust a lot more sort of pervasive, I find. Because I um, really have the intention to relate to to people who are growth-based, who are committed to their growth, I can only assume that that's what we're doing, that they're committing to their growth and I'm committing to mine. And that the choices I'm going to make are going to be largely based on my growth. And for, uh, for me, I have, I guess I struggle with the word trust because what am I trusting in that they're going to yeah. do what? Yeah. I'm, I trust that they're going to look in inwardly and be honest with themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. where trust comes in for me. Mm-hmm. I trust that they're doing the best that they can with who they are and what they know. Uh, Trust is an interesting one. As I was doing research for this panel and looking into, there is a a relationship anarchy manifesto. And in Oregon, who coined the term relationship anarchy, wrote a manifesto and you can find it online. Just look it up. Uh, And one of the things, so as I was going through, I was looking at them individually. I don't personally identify as a relationship anarchist. But as I was reading the manifesto, each point that she was making really resonated with me. And on trust, I think it's actually ultimately ends up about me trusting myself that I can, I am making the right decisions in that moment, including the people that I'm choosing to be in a relationship with. So it's like, you can, you you can only trust people like trusting somebody else is a leap of faith. At some point you just do it because you choose to do it. There is no guarantees. There is no, no, nobody can guarantee you because the only constant is change. People change, circumstances change. Even people make you promises. They, they don't want to break it. Circumstances change that they might have, they might have to. So with trust, especially in the context of this manifesto and relationship anarchy, I think it's ultimately trusting in yourself that you are choosing the right people to be around. When things come up, you will handle them in the best way that you can um, and, and go from there. That's kind of what I take away from it. 
Uh, I feel like sometimes when you hear the word trust, I also hear the word vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Like, how can I be vulnerable in a situation that has no certainty? And to that, I say no situation has certainty. Mm -hmm. And you hope to be in relationship with people Mm -hmm. who have a real willingness to look inwardly. And I think something that came up, I know, Wendy, you mentioned it. This is in the realm of trust, tolerance to ambiguity. You know, I talk a lot about in my practice about tolerance to ambiguity and uh, and what that means. So ambiguity, is essentially the unknown. And we have a sense. So often the opposite of tolerance to ambiguity, we're having a tolerance for ambiguity is control. So you either want to control or you have a tolerance and understanding that you can't control things. And I think it is only human to want to control our environment to feel safe and comfortable. And I think, you know, when do you saying like having tools to be able to do that and your, your Buddhist practice, like supporting you in doing that. I think it's a practice. I think naturally it doesn't come naturally. Our natural instincts are survival and comfort and security. And that manifests in control and like ownership, right? That's a natural way of the human brain working. So we actually have to like relearn stuff and, and have practices in place to be able to rewire ourselves, to be open and to be spacious and to be able to trust and, and let things happen. That's really sane. And I think it ties in with vulnerability in so far as vulnerability is a practice. Mm-hmm. And one of the things is opening up to other people being in that wide open kind of spaciousness, knowing that at any moment something can go down. That's you know? why it feels radical. Yeah. Because it is kind of scary. And just because we say this came naturally to us when we were 14 doesn't mean we don't succumb to the incredible impulse and fear mm-hmm. to put structure around it to protect ourselves because we're human. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This question here. So I have only been around the world of non monogamy for a couple of years. And the first time I heard relationship anarchy was actually here at a Curious Fox social. It was um, on communication. And I believe, Amir, you raised your hand and identified yourself as a relationship anarchist. And I'd never heard the term before. And in the context of where I was at that moment, trying to open up a monogamous relationship with someone, and there was lots of non-consensual, non-monogamy going on and lots of (laughs) gaslighting and cheating and lying and and not acting with integrity. It was a terrifying term to me. I didn't know what it meant. And my initial response when you identified yourself was that person must be selfish, cold, uncaring, unfeeling. (laughs) This is someone who doesn't care about other people and how they feel. And now that I know what it is, it feels very, very right and natural to me and in line with everything that I believe about not being able to control other people and how I put my friends and my lovers in the same plane, how I want to go about my relationships in in the future. But I wonder how often do you deal with that reaction and do you not identify yourself as that to people like, do you let people discover it naturally? Because <laughs> because you say that it's such an odd term. It's not something that's in the regular vernacular. And I'm sure even within the, the poly community, people probably bristle and think of you as other and cold and unfeeling and, and react poorly to it. So I'm just curious how you guys deal with that. In situations where I might uh, want some level of physical intimacy or be looking for that, it's been my experience so far. Just approach it by uh, still just getting to know people has not worked out well, actually, because one of the things that I noticed that happened, I, I would try to get to know someone and they really became quite attached very quickly and referred to me as their partner. And I'm like, well, I just like don't even know what you said. <laughs> I'm like, part. And I was like, look, look, <laughs> it was all done in texting. It was terrible. It was horrible. Um, but I was like, look, I don't do partner. Like I'm all right. Like they're like, yeah, I know what that means. You're using me. And I was just like, I think like really the underpinnings of this situation right now might have more to do with you, like being disembodied because you're having a reaction, you're having an experience and it's a big one and you're not willing to be with it. And that, my friend, is reason for me to get some space. <laughs> so, yeah, so I guess that kind of reaction does happen, but I don't usually, uh, I don't usually say it off the bat. I don't usually make announcements about it. I usually like to characterize how I relate or use descriptive words rather than label. Mm-hmm. Back to that, guys. I'm so sorry. It's a thing. 
one of the distinctions that as I was doing this research that came up was, you know, there's a lot of conversation around what is the fundamental differences between non-hierarchical polyamory and relationship anarchy. And I think the thing that ultimately, the clearest thing I can get to is not separating what we say romantic relationships to other relationships. So when I hear Wendy say, like, I'm just talking about people I relate to. And I think that is the fundamental difference. It's the person that she does her taxes to the doorman to, you know, the, the barista. It took me a while to just try to like parse this out for myself to understand. And I think the, the one that really sticks out is that there's like anybody that you relate to versus the people that you're in a relationship with. That's my air quotes. And, that- and also I would note that the, another big difference is that in RA, you can be sexually exclusive and monogamous if mm. you choose to. Right. If that's an arrangement that you've made with someone for any period of time, it's it's possible. For yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I wanna so I wanna relate to some of the things you you said about what distinguishes RA versus mm. yeah. non hierarchical mm-hmm. non monogamy. Yes, I, I agree. One of one of the aspects is the notion of taking away that construct of putting certain kind of relationships at the top and having a hierarchy of relationships, Mm -hmm. right? Because non-hierarchical, non-monogamy for some people still is very hierarchical. It's Mm -hmm. still like I have, maybe I don't call them primary and secondary, but they are sort of my whatever lovers Mm -hmm. or partners or whatever. And I think that that is an interesting discourse, right? About if you try to take away all of that hierarchy and and try to take away the ownership model of calling people my this or my that, then, you know, short of names, you're not left with a lot of other options. We've we've experimented with that personally and we end up, uh, we, someone I'm seeing, (laughs) Because yeah, like quite I'm literally, you, you are actually yeah. seeing them. <laughs> <laughs> Very literal. Yeah. <laughs> that was good. Yeah. Uh, or friends. Friends is nice. Yeah, I like friends. friends because at the end of the day, that is at the basis of we wish one should the, hope. Yeah. Right? <laughs> one should hope, right? To, to your and then sometimes they're not well. friends. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes they're people you had a really good time with. <laughs> right. So that happens. Yeah. But the other the other <laughs> thing that I think is. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> The other thing that I think is actually really important to bring up again is politics, mm-hmm. right? So it's not just about a style of, mono, of mm-hmm. non-monogamy. It's actually trying to challenge mm-hmm. a lot of those notions of control and ownership that are at the core mm-hmm. of monogamy. And once you start challenging that and deconstructing that and challenging the patriarchal basis of monogamy, and when you challenge patriarchy, you'd start to see all the other Uh, systems of control in society like capitalism and racism and other things that are trying to put people in hierarchies. So once you start to do that, try to bring all of that into how we relate to each Mm -hmm. other and breaking away all of those structures of power. And first of all, recognizing that Mm -hmm. the systems of power existing, any kind of relationship, and then try to, uh, you know, not let that dictate mm-hmm. uh, the way we relate to each other and, and making the personal into political. Mm-hmm. I think that is a very important part of what sure. relationship anarchy yeah. is yeah. about. Interesting. I was introduced to our relationship anarchy, the term itself, by someone who actually told me that he had a girlfriend he sleeps with every day. So it kind of sounded hierarchical, but that's not the point. The point is that I think it's a very interesting term. And as coming from the 60s, etc., when we use anarchy, we don't use it lightly. It's actually not just an individual choice. It's a movement. It's a political movement, yes. There are two, many issues related. First is, as someone said, it's not very palatable. It's not very marketable to others, you know. I do just what I want. So where is the organizing principle? Is it just my will and my self-governance? But what is actually governing my self-governance? So one thing is, what's the value added to polyamory? Or to, actually it's not been asked, but to non-conventional or unconventional ethical consensual non monogamy So I think that we have a big challenge, not just in communication, in the term itself or the label, but in defining what what's the uh, the politics of it. I love the term myself, anarchist. I feel an anarchist. For me, it's rival, radical, 
anti-centralization, you know, patriarchy, etc. But how do you move from that to the relationship realm? And all I have heard so far, I'm sorry that to be a little disappointed because it's more like I, 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 I did, I did, I did. It's story driven. And actually the idea is to create a movement like polyamory. What would you want to? So it's just questions I that disagree are, as well. Yeah, but yeah. I'm just trying to challenge question. you between the big picture politics, which is you know the intellectual part, and then how do we translate that in our day to day lives, but being true to the term anarchist as well? Okay. So I think you actually mentioned a, a, a key word there uh, as part of that, which is consent, right? And and people like to talk about consensual mon non monogamy. Uh, but a lot of times that means completely different things that actually translate to control rather than consent. I, I think if, if we go back to that notion of building the relationship not based on a preconceived notion of what a relationship of type A needs to look like, and we talk about these notions of designing them, the design is done with uh, you know, looking for consent as the guiding principle, right? And that could be quite radical, right? Because we're not talking about sex necessarily, right? And I think that's something you brought up in, in some of your talks as well. Think about how people treat food in most cultures, right? It's completely coercive, right? And most of our notion of how we relate to intimate uh, people around our lives is, is tend to be very coercive. So just the notion of moving to a, a place where we negotiate consent constantly and in, in everything that we do, I think, is quite radical as, as a way of going beyond the self. And to me, that's, that's another key principle. Yeah, I think there was a specific yeah. question regarding uh, relationship anarchy as a movement and anarchy broadly as a movement. And then I guess the idea was how does relationship anarchy sync up with the notion of anarchy as a movement? Yeah. Uh, and, and it brings the question up of should RA be a movement? And also, um, what kind of value does that add to the already, you know, world of polyamory? Right, I heard that which was the other question on top of that. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> now that we nailed that I'll, out. I'll add the, I'll, I'll, I'll address the second one, um, because that's the one that I really got excited about. If it's all about I, 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 I'd like to kind of flip that and say it's about choice rather than a self-absorbed kind of dynamic, which that could easily, again, that's not unique to polyamory or monogamy or nama. It's just you as a person, right? Whether or not you consider other people, I don't think has anything to do with anarchy. That's just your construct as a person. That's just how you are. But yeah, if one of the, the foundation or, you know, defining principles of anarchy is autonomy, there is a, a level of I and choice involved. And what kind of value does it actually bring to a relationship? And to that, I mean, I can only answer for myself. And that is that I have the freedom to truly love radically because it's my choice. So to make this really simple, I'm going to make an example out of it. I'll just bring a real example. I don't have to go home tonight. I don't have to. In fact, if I want to spend the night somewhere, I will. But I go home because I love him and I want to. And there's nothing more radical about that. There's nothing that really communicates love more than having choice. So for me, autonomy is the space to radically love because it's my choice to, not because it was inflicted on me by culture. So it's not self-absorbed as much as it is my choice to actually give in a way that really helps me thrive. And when it's my choice and I'm thriving, you can thrive in that love because it's not forced. That's how I would just personally answer that. Uh, my answer is RA should not be for everyone. It's not for everyone. It does not need to be widespread and it does not need to be a movement. Um, mm -hmm. There are lots of other ways to do anarchy that will work and make sense for you. Or there are lots of other ways to resist the way the larger society is organized that don't work for you. RA is not the only way to do it. So I would definitely say that it could be detrimental. I think I was saying this before we came in here. It could be detrimental for someone to engage in relationship as I do without the, the right tools to do so or without the aptitude to do so or the, the you know, certain 
personality traits and various other things to do so. Like it could be detrimental. And I don't think it's a good idea, actually. I think there are lots of other ways to push back against um, the powers that be and to deconstruct the system, so to speak. And NRA is not the only way to do it. I would say to that end that power dynamics are at play in all of our relationships and that there is value in addressing them in your relationship, particularly as a woman, particularly as a person of color, particularly uh, as a queer person who is relating in the world. Uh, those power dynamics should always, always, always be addressed, um, no matter how you design your relationship. I think that kind of goes back to, to your question about the political or social movement. Yeah, th that is anarchism, right? And it's just bringing anarchism into the realm of relationships. But yeah, as a social movement, it's it's really just anarchism. And I think anarchism is is very alive, very much alive and well these days as a political movement. I like what you said about radical love. I think that kind of gives us a certain glue to hold our our society in a way that's different than the current sort of political structures that, that are in place. So there's been a mention of rules and boundaries, and I was wondering if you could help me understand the difference. And is it more about the way in which you come to agree on them, or, it, or is there actually some difference, and are those helpful terms in discussing this? To kind of clarify maybe the distinction, right? I don't have penetrative sex with others without a condom. That would be a boundary. You will not have penetrative sex with other people without a condom is a rule. And as but an weirdly, anarchist- Weirdly, they kind of do impact each other. They do. But as right? an anarchist, Great. I don't believe that I have any rights to- Can you make a request? I can make any request, but I don't, I, I wouldn't even make that request of you. I would rather know about it, right? If you decided Definitely know to about do it. that. Yeah. But I believe that, you know, my first responsibility is for myself, right? So I'd much rather get tested every three months, right? And, and find out about things early rather than try to control all of my partners and my partner's partners and trying to get to a point where I'll be quote unquote safe, right? And that goes back to that notion of control. Really romantic centric, mm -hmm. I just want to say. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but you do find that a lot in polyamorous circles, oh, right? Yeah, it's like, I want to know exactly when. Topic, I sure. Like, yeah. I want to control the whole polycule and that's how we're all going to yeah. be safe. And that takes you right back to monogamy. And I don't think there's anything necessarily negative about the desire to control that. Honestly, like, I don't want us to necessarily be super anti the other side. Like, if you have a desire to be with partners who are always wearing condoms or not. Like, I actually think that that's like you mentioned, anarchy is not for everybody. So I don't, I wouldn't necessarily say that's control. It's also health. You know what I mean? So there's two sides of the coin. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I want to add just the, the, the rules and the boundaries part that one of the things, again, if you research um, a relationship anarchy, you find your manifesto. One of the, one of the things that mentioned this idea of, uh, of finding your core belief system, your core values. So I think that might be a different way of looking at it rather than looking at rules and boundaries is what the manifesto suggests is that you found your core values and that those are your North star. Like you align your decisions, your, your interactions according to this North star that you decide for yourself, which is your value system. And the way that works out is a combination of boundaries, rules, whatever you want to call it. But that's just how you get there. I think what sort of dictates it is this North Star that you choose for yourself. And I think if you communicate that to your partners, this is my value system. These are the values that I, I live by. I think the boundaries, rules, agreements will take care of themselves in ongoing, healthy, intentional communication. I don't know if that aligns with what, what you guys believe. Yeah. I, I would concur. I think boundaries are something that one constantly negotiates and redefines for oneself. It's part of a healthy yeah. relating. Rules to me is something that's static that one tries to put in place to, to make. Often the, made, right? they're, yeah. often, they're often ready made. They're not based yeah. on yeah. me and you meeting and, and figuring it out. It's like my experience told me this. So this is the hard mm -hmm. stop. And rules often are ready made. They come from, you know, um, the societal sort of norms and mm -hmm. dictates. And it's kind of like cool. a yeah. turn off. Yeah. Boundaries also don't have to be necessarily verbalized in such a way. So when you're bringing the, the example 
Uh, a lot of times, you know, boundaries could be actually enforced by behavior, right? One, one can sort of act in certain ways that create boundaries between the self and, and the other, right? And puts up certain space for, uh, sure. for a reason. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to do the last question and then we're going to wrap up. Mm -hmm. We have three. Let's do a quick. Can we have all the three questions and we'll try to address them as well as we can and, that, and we'll wrap up and we're over to. Without there being rules necessarily, but there can be things that make partners very uncomfortable and possibly emotionally hurt. How do you show consideration and care for their feelings without it being that you're adjusting your behavior or limiting your behavior? How do you still show compassion for your other partners? So, Conchetta, I, I mean, what you said resonated throughout and... Um... I mean, like I was raised as kind of a rule follower and I was just curious whether you like experienced in your life, like a lot of clashes with authority figures in school, whether you still do, if you have work, that situations, you know, is that, is that like universal for your life or is it in relation? It's just like, how is, how is life with all the rebelliousness and the anarchy, mm -hmm. you know, throughout? It's a, it's a good question because we go back to the, the, the idea that this is relationship. Anarchy means all of relationships, not just your romantic relationships, right? So if that's your attitude to all relationships, that is colleagues, that is people that you interact with day to day. So how is that working out for you guys? <laughs> Okay, we're gonna add this. So, how do you show how do you show compassion uh, when there are no structures? Suggest so that, and then and then how is how is relationship anarchy in general working out for you guys? Yeah, in in, in life, compassion compassion is a practice. It's a daily practice. It starts with me. Uh, gentleness starts here in me, and how I work with my own content and material ideally radiates outward um, into my relationships. Uh, more pragmatically. Um, so someone approaches me and says, um, it doesn't usually come you know, when these things happen, they don't usually, they're not so civilized. So, you know, <laughs> someone's having a, a, a blowout, you know, and they're like, I don't know what's, what's come on. You, you do this like every day you get to hear people's stuff. Give me an example of like a relational blowout so I can oh, give an uh, example of addressing it. The big one is this is not what we agreed to. This is not what thing, yeah. <laughs> it's harder as an RA person. Yeah. This is not what we agreed to. So say there was some, some former agreement. You know, and I'm probably upset because I'm not going to be super therapeutic right now. OK, let's take some space. I see that you're hurting and I'm hurting. Can we take some space and come back to this? Uh, because I really want to respond to you from the, the deepest, most compassionate place in me. Yeah. I start with space and then I come back after having really sat with what the person said. I try I generally try to see if there's any truth in what they said and, and what is actually true. Uh, for me and for them also. And sometimes my truth and their truth aren't, in, aren't aligning. And then I try to uh, reapproach it. And I say, this is, I sat with this and this is what I'm seeing. What are you seeing? And then it just becomes this process of, of working things out and having a talk about the underlying emotions as well as, you know, the more practical aspects of things, mm -hmm. but it's a process yeah. and it's ongoing. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if you just repeat that that wording one more time. Is that how do you show compassion towards the person you're with without what was the? Oh well, like if they're uncomfortable or feel emotionally like stirred up by something, mm -hmm. but you're not going you're not going to set like an actionable restriction on yourself. How do you right. still show them compassion? Yeah, I really like this question because it again it addresses something that in monogamy is sort of assumed that one is responsible for one's partner's emotions right and especially those difficult emotions that that we typically put on the umbrella of jealousy and things like that uh, and that is like the worst thing that can happen is you can make your uh, you know partner jealous and and all the constructs around that once you try to go away from that right and and see yourself as not, being responsible for somebody else's emotions, although you might be the cause of some of those emotions, you might have contributed to it, then there's a lot more space to kind of consider, first of all, to be compassionate, just like you said, and, and you mentioned that. Uh, so compassion is, is, first of all, I think, again, is, is one of those bases for healthy relationships, just like trust, just like the assumption of, of goodwill. And Sometimes I will change my actions, right? But the idea is to do that from, again, from a place of trying to discern what, what you were just saying, right? Uh, which is, where do I see my responsibility, right, for something? Did I, 
did I actually act against my own sort of belief system and my own values of what good relationship should be like, what good relating should be like, right? Did I basically, was I acting like an asshole, right? And that takes some some time and, and space, like you were saying, to, to sort of figure that out. Uh, and that is separate from your emotions and, and feelings of hurt. So it's sort of moving away from this assumption that there is some sort of objective truth and objective way that, you know, we're all just trying to sort of find into a much more subjective way of, of seeing things and really trying to see the other in their perspective. Yeah, unfortunately, we had to have to wrap up. Does anyone want to address the last question of like, how is anarchy working out for you and your other relationship and, and, and relationships? That was addressed to you. Yeah. yeah, I grew up in Japan and I'll make this really, really fast. We could talk afterwards. Japan is all about roles and tradition, not about uh, free will or your individuality. It's all about who you are in the structure of tradition and culture, right? I fought against that my whole life. Nine kids, hierarchical relationship, fought against that too. I do have an abusive childhood. And so I was constantly punished for having choice and freedom. So yes, that's why I'm here. What I find always is that strong authority without any reason and just for the sake of authority, I don't thrive. And a lot of people don't thrive in that. A lot of people. How I survive with this now, because we live in a hierarchical world and I'm fiercely non-hierarchical. How I survive in this is I try, if I'm in a space, in a work, in a contract that doesn't give me that. And I have to keep that job or relationship. I need to keep it alive and flourishing. Then I need to give myself some radical autonomy somewhere else and a huge amount of self-care. That is how I've learned to treat myself in this way. If I'm on a contract and musical theater is incredibly hierarchical and sometimes very abusive and it's a, a culture of bullying. If that's the case, then I need to make sure that I'm making work that no one tells me what to do and how to make it. And I get to do it on my terms, how I want to work with the people I want. As long as I'm satisfying it equally somewhere else, it doesn't create a seesaw effect in my life. If I'm not nurturing autonomy somewhere else and then I'm dealing with it, then I just feel oppressed and then I react. Um, We do have to wrap up, regretfully. A huge thank you to my panelists. Without them, this wouldn't happen. So there you are, foxes. A blast from the past and a fantastic dialogue about redefining relationships at its core. Mm, Yeah, I think that hearing that amazing panel did make relationship anarchy feel less intimidating. It was interesting to me that even within the panel, different folks defined or practiced relationship anarchy differently. Yeah, and I think that is that is what relationship anarchy is at its core. I think by design, it is what you design it is what you make of it and this is what uh, anarchy is in general so yeah i mean that that makes sense to me uh, we must also say that relationship anarchy is not for everyone for sure but there are takeaways from everyone in any type of relationship honoring your and your partner or partner's autonomy addressing any of the power dynamics within the relationship and the intentional design of what you want to create in the world So how do you define your relationships? Does relationship anarchy sound freeing or terrifying? We would love to hear your thoughts. You can leave us an anonymous message at 201-870-063 or email us or send us a voice memo at listening at wearecuriousfoxes.com. As always, we're going to continue the conversation on Patreon, where you can go and find some bonus content, questions for Patreon members. You not only get to support the Curious Fox community, but you get access to exclusive events, podcast extras, and a lot more. You can stay connected with us by joining in on the conversation on Instagram at Facebook at We Are Curious Foxes. Head to our website, at We Are Curious Foxes, where you can find all of this and our blog posts and the latest updates, and join our newsletter so that this way you can get all of this delivered right into your inbox. And for extra bonus points, like, follow, or share this podcast so that you can help us challenge the status quo in all things love, sex, and relationships. This episode is produced and edited by Nina Pollock, who gracefully manages our ever-anarchic approach to making podcasts. Our intro music is composed by Dave Saha, We are so grateful for their work and we are grateful to you for listening. As always, stay curious, friends. Curious Fox podcast is not and will never be the final word on any topic. 
We solely aim to encourage curiosity and provide a space for exploration through connection and story. We encourage you to listen with an open and curious mind, and we'll look forward to your feedback. Stay curious, friends. Stay curious. 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 Stay curious.